Well, hello there, Explorer. Welcome along to a brand new Fun Kids Science Weekly. My name is Dan. This is the show that searches the universe. We drag out all those science secrets that no one has looked into before. This week, we'll try and find out why animals eat what they do. Eating other organisms instead has its own different challenges. Because although the meat, for instance, is much easier to digest for the majority of animals, it's more difficult to access. And this week, our quest to find the best science carries on. It's all about analytical chemistry. What can that be? The gases that come off your skin and also your breath can tell us a lot about how healthy you are. The gases that come off your skin, which maybe you have never thought about before, I'm going to tell you a little bit about where they come from and why they might be helpful to us. And you can hear why a squirrel taking a train is very bad news for other squirrels. It's all on the way in a brand new Fun Kids Science Weekly. Let's start off with this week's Science in the News. The European Space Agency's latest group of astronauts have completed their basic training. They're now getting ready for a flight assessment to head to the space station or maybe even to the moon. You have Dr. Rosemary Coogan from the UK, also Sophie Adeno from France, Pablo Alvarez Fernandez from Spain, Raphael Lijoire from Belgium and Marco Siba from Switzerland. They were picked from more than 22 and a half thousand applicants. It was thought they have the right stuff to go to space in the last year. They've had medical, robotics and survival training. They've experienced weightlessness in a very special plane. They've been hurled around in a centrifuge to simulate the forces of a rocket launch. How brilliant is it that we are living in a time where we will send humans properly back into space to find some distant planets? We're giving them the training right now. It's fantastically inspiring, don't you think? Also, the US space agency NASA says the current mission to bring rocks back from Mars to planet Earth uh, can't really go on as planned. We won't get the samples back before 2040 on the existing funds. It's too much money. We need a more sustainable option. So NASA is thinking about cheaper, faster, more out-of-the-box creative ideas. They say that returning rock samples from Mars is the most important priority for exploring planets across the solar system. It has been for 10 years or more because it'll help us discover whether there could be life on other planets so if you have an idea for maybe bringing rocks back from mars have a think could make nasa like you quite a lot you could go up in standing with them and in our final story this week it's a wild story in every meaning of the word experts think that a gray squirrel might have caught a train to wales where there are loads of red squirrels And it sadly might have destroyed them all. Now, the squirrel has been captured now, thanks to incredible work from Dr. Craig Shuttleworth from Bangor University, who joins us. Craig, thank you for being there. What made you aware that there was a grey squirrel somewhere it shouldn't have been? Right, well, this this is the island of Anglesey off the north coast of Wales, and it's all red squirrel. There's no grey squirrels there. And a member of the public was out with a ca- one of these little wildlife cameras that you can set out to try and get a photograph of wildlife, and they got a picture of a grey squirrel on it. So you've spotted the squirrel in the photo, and then do you notice effects on your red squirrel population? No, luckily. And you're quite right to ask that question because the grey ones, the grey squirrels, carry a virus that doesn't harm them in any way whatsoever. But if they spread it and the red ones pick it up, they die. So we were really worried, but we, it looks as if we were lucky and grey one hadn't spread the virus to the red ones. Ah, well, that's fortunate. I mean, when I was um, reading this story, Craig, and the article said that this grey squirrel might have like killed a lot of the red squirrels, it sounded like something from a horror movie that it was trying to do it intentionally, but it's just because of a virus that they are carrying, yeah? Yeah, they carry it. It doesn't harm them at all. They live with it. They look okay. They, they behave normally. They don't have any symptoms. But if the red ones get it, they get these nasty blisters on their bodies, around their mouths, around their eyes, and it kills them. And now, as I said, thanks to tireless work from you and a few other people, the, uh, the squirrel has been captured. When you know it's on the loose, how do you begin to track down a squirrel? 
right, you use these cameras again, the ones I mentioned before, the one that the member of the public had, you can buy these for like 40 quid, 50 pound maybe. You put them out in the woodland, you set them to take a photograph if, if any animal walks in front of it. And then you look through the images. We set out these cameras and then we got two of the cameras had images of a grey squirrel on it. And then we try and catch the grey squirrel at those locations. So we try and narrow it down first. And then we try and catch the squirrel once we know roughly where it is. And when you know roughly where it is, is, is it a case of trying to lure the squirrel to you? Yeah, what you do is you put a, a, a trap out. It's like a little rectangle made out of mesh. You put some food outside of a little door that, that is the way inside that mesh box. And then you put some more food inside and the squirrel goes in. And, and when it goes inside, if it treads on a particular bit of the floor, that makes the door shut behind it and then it's trapped inside. That's the traps that we use. Another incredible part of the story is you think that it might have caught the train to Wales. Why is that? When I was talking to some people about it. They asked, how do these squirrels get across the Menai Strait? This is a big sea channel that separates the island from mainland. And I said, well, we had one turn up right in the north of the island at the port of Holyhead, and that's possibly come in by train. There was another one that we think came in inside a camper van. We've got pictures of them swimming across the sea strait. So these guys uh, are really quite used to travelling across landscapes. And occasionally, because a lot of them in in the country, they hop onto vehicles and then they just end up randomly at that destination where the vehicle was going. We've got pictures of girls on mountaintops there's no trees there. It's many, many miles away from the nearest sort of habitat. So they've got the capacity to wander around to try and find somewhere else to live, a new, a new start, if you like. And, and I know that there have been reports that I, I think I heard squirrels have swam across the strait, have been spotted. Why are they so keen to get there, this, this new start? They don't know what's on the other side of the water. And if they're in a place where... There's lots of squirrels already and times are tough. They've got to compete with each other for food. You know, they eat different types of seeds and nuts. But when there's a lot of them, there's competition. So sometimes one or two of them think, okay, I'll I'll make a dash and head over the horizon, see if life is better over there, and off they go. And so they're not planning on finding anything in particular. They're just exploring out in that landscape. And sometimes they come across sea channels or canals or rivers and they swim it. And last question, Craig. Why is it important to have a thriving population of red squirrels on Anglesey? What do they do for the island? It's what the island does for them. It's the home of one of the biggest populations left in Wales. Elsewhere, there are only a few hundred red squirrels in the whole of the mainland. So why is that? It's because there's grey squirrels across almost all of Wales, apart from the island. And where there is grey squirrels, the greys carry this virus. And also they compete for the red squirrel. The grey is a lot bigger. It's maybe just over half the size, again, of a red squirrel. So it's bigger. They're more dominant. Most people in the country now don't see red squirrel. They just see the grey ones. But if they were to go back a couple of hundred years, there weren't any grey squirrels here. There was just red ones. So the island offers a home, a last chance for red squirrels to hang on because it looks as if across most of the rest of Wales, there are hardly any left. Wow. Thank you for your work. We're trying to keep this population thriving. Uh, Dr. Craig Shuttleworth, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Let's get to some of your questions then. If you have anything sciencey that you want answered on this show, anything at all, I love it. I love doing the digging. I love doing a little bit of looking myself and also getting a proper genius on in that field to tell us more. Best way that you can send a question to me is as a voice note on the free Fun Kids app or at funkidslive.com. First one this week, we've got Amelia, who is in Oxfordshire, who sent a message, wants to know, how old is the world's oldest tree? Well, it's considered to be one called Methuselah. It's a great basin bristlecone pine. Now, it doesn't look like it has many leaves. It looks really old, which it is, and, and decrepit, something like something out of a, a horror film, really. It's got this thick, twisting trunk with chunky, bare branches that spin, that twist and reach into the sky. It's over five metres tall. 
it does look terrifying, really. Experts think it's around 4,800 years old. It's found in California in the Inyo National Forest there. But that's all we know. Its actual precise location is kept a secret to protect the tree from people that might want to go there, might want to do some damage because they think it will get them famous or something. So we know it's in California, but they won't tell us any more about where Methuselah, what we think is the world's oldest tree, actually is, Amelia. Thank you so much for the question. Let's get on another one then. This is a, a voice note from Zoe. Thank you, Zoe. It's all about what animals really eat. Why can some animals only eat vegetables? or eat meats when humans can eat both. Zoe, thank you for your question. Why can some animals only eat veg or meat? Why can we humans eat both? Why are we carnivores, omnivores, herbivores? Let's find out. Helping us is Dr. Carlo Maloro from Liverpool John Moores University. Carlo, thank you so much for being there. So why do some animals eat all different types of foods? How does this begin? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, animals obviously have evolved uh, uh, for millions of years. So what we can see now of the animal diversity is just a glimpse of what has been in the past as well. And um, animals uh, evolved basically to exploit any opportunities. Now, depending on this, they have changed their system, especially the skeletal one for chewing the food, for instance, and for dealing with the food or the digestive system in general, so things like the gut. Now, there are some um, foods that are obviously more convenient to eat than others. So if you have a look at the earth, for instance, from the space, you will see obviously that the earth is generally blue because we have a lot of uh, water, but we also have a lot of green, which stands for the grass. So the grass is obviously the the kind of food that is most uh, available for all the animals. The main problem of the grass is that it's not very easy to digest. So certain animals actually have evolved a symbiotic kind of life with the bacteria that helps them to digest efficiently the grass, which is the easiest food that you can try to eat if you think about its abundance. Eating other organisms instead has its own different challenges because although the meat, for instance, is much easier to digest for the majority of animals, it's more difficult to access. So you have predators that have evolved things like weapons, like uh, big canines and big clothes and um, sprinting, for instance, for speed. That's because the animal food, although it's easier to digest in theory, it's more difficult to catch. And these obviously impose some limitation. Now, there are certain animals instead that are capable of eating both things. But this is uh, something that probably some of the earliest creatures start to experience. But they cannot digest very efficiently the grass, for instance, and the veg. Now, the way we have evolved uh, is quite complicated because, as you know, we are primates. So we belong to a special group of mammals. And primates, the majority of them are frugivores. Frugivores stands for the fact that most of the primates, like uh, monkeys and big apes, they live in the tropical environment. And in the tropical environment, the easiest food to access is actually fruit because it's also the most nutritious and it's less difficult to eat. We've evolved this system because different species thrive and do very well when they make the most of what's around them. Now, if we think about a carnivore, Carlo, something like a, like a lion, for instance, right? We're a big, yeah, fearsome beast. If we were to travel back thousands and thousands of years to an early ancestor of a lion, would they have eaten many, many, many more plants? than current lions do, but the ones that we have have evolved the ability to just really feast on meat a few times a day. Well, actually, it's it's a little bit more uh, complex uh, because through the evolution in reality, what we really see is that one of the, if we want to talk just about mammals, because obviously we have reptiles and different other kind of animals that have different kind of uh, evolutionary pathways through through their um, history. So uh, basically the most common source of diet for the early uh, ancestor of uh, the majority of mammals used to be insects. 
So in reality, uh, let's say the ancestor of the ancestor of the ancestor of the lion uh, used to be probably an insectivore. So capable still of killing something slightly smaller than itself. So what happened is that as they grow in size as well, some animals decided to specialize towards eating other animals. So as long as they were capable of killing and hunting something of a similar size or smaller, they were evolving and becoming more specialized as predators. Others instead did the different pathways and they were like, okay, we can go for something more available and, and easy to access like grass, but that would be more difficult to digest. So luckily they've evolved a system in their gut that allows this digestion. But the most simplest uh, source of food for mammals in particular has been generally insects and uh, always other organisms because they were easier to digest from a certain point of view and also to access. It's been fantastic to answer your question, Zoe. Thank you for sending it in. And thank you, Dr. Carlo Meloro, uh, for coming on and joining us. Oh, thank you very much for your time. I hope you, I, I provided some answers. Obviously, nature is, is very, very complex and I will be more than welcome to address more issues if they come through. Thank you so much to Carlo Maloro for coming on and telling us why different animals eat different things. It's all about evolution, right? The way species survive is by making the most of what's around them and adapting for their environment. Thank you, Carlo. And thank you, Zoe, for the question. If you have anything you want answered next week on the podcast, make sure you leave it as a voice note for me on the free Fun Kids app or at funkidslive.com. And let's get to this week's Dangerous Dan there. where we take a look at the weirdest, meanest, strangest, most unique, most often deadly things in the world. And this week, we'll take a look at trees all around the globe. Well, not actually the trees, but what grows around them and can often kill them. You'll find the strangler fig on trees across the planet, normally in hot climates in Australia, Africa and Florida. It begins its life as a sticky seed which attaches to an animal who then climbs to the top of a tree and accidentally drops it off high up in a tree's canopy and then the plant grows. It can't go up, there's nowhere really to go. So it works from the top down. It sends roots downwards, thick, brown, crawling, spindling roots which wind its way down the tree to the ground. And as it goes down, it strangles its host tree. It winds downwards like a staircase, completely covering it up, really, until finally these roots take hold in the ground. It takes the sunlight, takes the water, takes the nutrients from the soil. And it's too competitive for the tree. And usually, ultimately, that kills off the host tree. Not just that, it's thick canopy, too. The massive roots and wood around the tree from the top down they normally block out a lot of sunlight which shades other plants and it makes it hard for them to live and the creatures that live off those plants find it tricky to stay alive too which is why the strangler fig is a perfect name for this deadly twisted and twisting plant and it goes straight on to our dangerous dan list it's the fun kids science weekly and it's time For the battle of the sciences, every week we get a genius and expert on to pitch why their field should be first, why their science should rule all. Today, we are headed to Dublin City University from the School of Chemical Sciences, chatting to Dr. Aoife Morin, all about the science of analytical chemistry. There's a lot going on and it could be very helpful for you. Let's find out more then. Dr. Aoife, you have one minute to pitch why your science should come first. That minute starts in three, two, one. Take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm here to talk about my research and really what I think might be interesting to you guys is the possibility in the future that you won't need needles for taking blood if you're not feeling so well. So if you go to the doctors, there's no chance of anyone prodding you with a needle. And the reason that we think that this might become a possibility is that we can think we might be able to in the future get as much health information about you or about any person from just sampling the gases that are essentially around you. So the gases that come off your skin 
skin and also your breath can tell us a lot about how healthy you are. The gases that come off your skin, which maybe you have never thought about before, I'm going to tell you a little bit about where they come from and why they might be helpful to us. Oh, Aoife, that is your minute. And that was actually perfect. It's given us us up brilliantly for uh, uh, some teasing thoughts there. So a lot of this science is all to do with our skin and the fact that gases are released, just like we breathe. Where do these gases come from? The gases that come off our breath, if you like, they come from our lungs. So the lung organ, when we breathe in and breathe out, Different processes happen in the lungs and the the breath is expelled. But in exactly the same way, our skin is also breathing. So there's bacteria that sit on our skin all the time. It's very healthy and very normal. And what those bacteria do in order to survive is that they feed off what's in our skin. So within the glands of our skin, we have lots of glands where we produce our sweat. They feed off all those nutrients that we are producing so that they can survive on the surface of the skin. Once they eat those, they start to metabolize them and break them down. And ultimately, they produce these small molecules in the form of a gas that we can now capture and analyze so that we can hope in the future we can tell something about our health. We might be able to tell what food we've eaten. We might be able to tell if we have diabetes. We might be able to tell what age we are. So there's lots of potential in this area of research. When you capture that gas, what are you looking for? What are the signs in it that's telling us what we've eaten, what might be wrong with us if we are sick? So that's, again, great question. What we do is we look for signs of whether or not the body or the bacteria on our skin has been stressed. So if it has gone through a particular stress, maybe in terms of being sick or having an infection in the body, that we would expect to see a certain class of compounds that can indicate this. You mentioned in your minute, your minute cell, that if we were scared of needles, this is brilliant because we don't need to get our blood taken. Now, in your blood, I think scientists look for key markers along the way, little levels that are rising, stuff that shouldn't be there. How can that be seen through what's in a gas? There's a a very close link between the metabolites that are produced in the form of a gas and what our body is producing. So the the markers that we see potentially in blood. So for example, if you have diabetes, it's glucose that we're looking for is the diagnostic marker, the marker to see how your what your insulin levels are like. So that is present in blood, but the blood is also in communication with the skin. The blood is also telling the skin and indeed telling all our organs how healthy we are and what those glucose levels are doing, for example, or have you an infection in your stomach, for example. That's talking to the blood, which is talking to the skin. So we can indirectly see a lot of things that are present in blood within our skin, which of course is the biggest organ in our body. We have a lot, a lot of skin. So we've lots of areas where we can do some really, really cool analytical chemistry. Now, Aoife, let me throw you forward 30, 40, 50 years, when when you're kind of done with your career, what's the question that you really want to answer? What do you want to know and solve and have discovered through that time? I'd love to think that we really were at a place where we could really maximise or get the most information out of the body without having to go inside the body. But what happens when we get to that point? What happens when we can go into our local chemist and buy one of these sticky sponges and coupled with a mass spectrometer and we can do this analysis ourselves? What happens when we find we might have a serious condition where we don't have a doctor telling us about this condition, but rather we're now using the internet to understand this condition that this sensor is talking to us about. That's massive. And that's something that has to come down the tracks and be dealt with later on around the idea that if we can diagnose disease without a doctor, then there's very serious implications for how we deal with that disease. And we really need to be sure that we're managing these new technologies correctly for the benefit of, you know, a population's health or our society. Well, it's a brilliant sell and lots to think through. I mean, this is a science that is taking us into the future. It's been a treat to chat to you, Dr. Aoife Morin. Thank you for being there. Thank you, Don. 
So earlier in the show, we chatted to Dr. Carlo Maloro all about what animals eat. And I hope you found that a really amazing chat about how animals have adapted to use the world around them to get the food and the nutrients they need to survive. I, I thought we would have a, learn a little bit more about that now with one of our favourite superheroes, Kay Mystery. She's also called Karina. That's her human name, but her superhero alter ego is Kay Mystery. They're exploring the world of chemistry with us. And Karina has got a pet gerbil as well, Mr Nibbles. But Kay Mystery explain all about what Nibbles needs to stay alive and the chemistry in the food that it eats. Karina's Chemistry, with support from the Royal Society of Chemistry. Gerbils are rubbish. I wanted a rabbit. Mr Nibbles is particularly rubbish, because all he does is eat nuts and sleeps. Boring. So it was kind of good timing when my superhero alter ego showed up. Hiya! Ooh, cute gerbil. Did you know that gerbils are packed with chemistry? What? I think he's packed with nuts at the moment. He doesn't do anything. I think I'm going to swap him for my friend Freya's ferret. Doesn't do anything? You are so wrong. He's alive, isn't he? Uh, well, I think he is. Hang on, I'll just give him a poke to check. Ah, leave him in peace. Staying alive takes a lot of work, whatever the animal is. Human or gerbil. And it's chemistry that's doing all that work. What? Even when he's just snoring away? Right. Let's start with the snoring. Welcome to your gerbil's lungs. We're right in the tiniest alveoli and the air is being pulled in pushed out. But we need to get even smaller to see what's happening. Hold your breath. Where's the air gone? And what are all those lumpy, knobbly things flying about? Ouch! This is the air! It's a gas exchange. Oxygen molecules are passing out of the air into the blood and carbon dioxide molecules are passing out of the blood into the air. It's like a really cool swap. Is this respiration? Nah, this is just breathing. It might get oxygen into the bloodstream, but it's... Well, a bit like bringing logs to a bonfire. They won't keep you warm till you set them alight. Come on, I'll show you how the oxygen gets to work. Every cell in your body needs energy to do its job, to keep you alive. Glucose in your muscles from the food you eat combines with the oxygen and... That creates energy. Lots of it. And that's respiration. It's like fireworks. And look, the leftover bits are making new molecules too. Wow, they're beautiful. Yep, you remember that matter is never destroyed, it just changes form. Well, carbon dioxide and water molecules are created with the waste products from respiration, which are breathed out or, well, you know, flushed down the toilet. And the same chemical reaction goes on a million times every day cells are terrific at recycling and all that's going on in a tiny sleepy gerbil you've got it although gerbils don't use the toilet obviously it's kind of weird because i knew that the lungs and our muscles were part of bodies i never really wondered what they were made of cool isn't it your entire body is made up of six main types of building blocks oxygen hydrogen carbon nitrogen calcium and phosphorus they work together Combine and separate in a load of different ways. Even when your hair grows or you get a grazed knee and it heals up. Well, there's nothing new really. Just the same chemicals recycling in amazing new ways. Let's see if we can spot any on our way out. Oxygen and hydrogen are everywhere. Yeah, they're pretty popular. Mainly because they make water. And two thirds of your body is water. Oh, look over there. That's carbon. We saw that as part of carbon dioxide, and it's part of glucose too. It's a very flexible element, so it's used in tons of chemical reactions. And there's calcium. Oh yeah, you need that for your teeth and your bones, don't you? Mm. Your body mainly needs the calcium for reactions in your cells. And we'll even grab the calcium from your bones if it can't get enough. There's some nitrogen. 
Your DNA needs that to help it hand out instructions to cells. Well, look, there's some potassium. The cells responsible for keeping your heart beating need potassium. There's a heap of other elements too, but those are like the biggest gang. I think we should get out of here. Sounds like Mr. Nibbles is finally waking up. Karina! That's Dad. Gotta go. I have to admit, my gerbil is a lot more interesting than I realised. Maybe he isn't all that bad. So you won't give him to Freaky Freya? I heard she dresses her ferrets up. I don't think Mr. Nibbles would like that. Nah, he can stay. <laughs> Shame I can't. Bye for now, Karina. Karina's Chemistry, with support from the Royal Society of Chemistry. Find out more at funkidslive.com. And that is it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you so much to K Mystery, to Dr. Carlo Maloro, for Craig all about squirrels going on trains if there is anything you want answered next week on the show make sure you leave as a voice note for me on the free fun kids app or at funkidslive.com you heard from k mystery earlier we've got loads more brilliant podcast series that you can hear on the free fun kids app on google spotify wherever you get your shows to and fun kids we are a children's radio station from the uk listen all over the country on your dab digital radio on the free fun kids app and at funkidslive.com 